presenter today is Holly Falk Krasinski, who is the VP of Strategic Alliances at the um, publisher Elsevier, along with an adjunct senior instructor in School of Professional Studies at Northwestern. So Holly is certainly uh, no stranger to this circle of uh, academics. I feel that I've, I don't, I think I've met you once, Holly, but I feel like I've seen your name for, for many moons, <laughs> and you are certainly um, a well-known presence in the field of teen science. Um, and today, our topic will be evidence-based guidance for the successful practice of teen science. Um, and if you'll note in the description that Karen provided of the, of the session, I mean, obviously, team science is something that's becoming an increasingly high priority for funding bodies such as the NIH, as well as academia in general. But it comes with a significant time um, and coordination cost. So it's very important that um, folks who are engaged in this enterprise really have the most effective practices for making it a productive um, effort. So today, Holly's going to talk a little bit about um, evidence-based resources that are actually focused on um, effective practices in team science. So with that being said, I'll pass the baton to Holly and welcome. All right, thanks so much, Amanda. I appreciate it. And I'll just start by saying that I work at Elsevier, and while Elsevier does publish things, it's really an information analytics company with far more diverse set of resources than simply the journals and texts that it publishes. And it's actually in the other domain in which I operate, and I'll share, um, in fact, some specific information. Hang on, let me kind of move this out of the way. So you don't all see that. Um, so I'll share some more information near the end of this of the kinds of things that I've been involved in at Elsevier and, and, and why I'm, I'm working where I'm at. All right, so let's talk about team science, but from an evidence base, which I think is really critically important. Why is it my page now? Okay. Oh. Okay. Let's try that. All right, well, there we go. That, okay, that seems to work. Okay, yeah. Um, so let's start first. I really love this. The universal increase of team science. It's increasing impact and boundary spanning creative capacity all point to team science as central to the future of scientific and technological advancement. And this was said back four years ago at the Science of Team Science Conference. And I think it's uh, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that if there's this opportunity to transform how science and research are being done, then especially those of us involved in InterReach have a, a great opportunity to, to play to advance these things in our own research teams and groups. Uh, just a little bit about myself. So um, I'm at uh, Elsevier, which I've already said is an information in, uh, analytics company, and I've been in my current role for just about five years. Right before that, I'd been a faculty member at Northwestern University for 15 years. I continue to hold an appointment there because I continue to do some teaching, specifically in the area of grantsmanship. Uh, but before that, held uh, research and administrative positions in the College of Arts and Sciences, Central Administration, and the Medical School, all um, primarily with the focus of issues related to interdisciplinary research and, and team science. I'm a traditionally trained scientist. I have a, a bachelor's and a PhD in scientific disciplines and did a, a short-lived postdoc before moving into my role in, um, uh, into the role in uh, Northwestern. I started my research career though actually in industry um, and was at Abbott Laboratories for uh, two and a half years doing anti-HIV AIDS uh, research. And then I also have a, a pretty robust nonprofit experience a career outside of academia. I've been the editor-in-chief of the Association for Women in Science magazine, and I'm also the founding president of NORDUP, which is the National Organization of Research Development Professionals, which is another group, and, and we've talked about that in InterReach webinars before, Christine, when she gave her last webinar of where InterReach and, and NORDUP and I2S intersect and where there's some unique um, aspects to all of these uh, professions as well. Uh, so what have I been really involved in? Um, so connecting researchers and resources in pursuit of very large collaborative projects. I've compiled and curated uh, about a 2,000 reference library, and I'll tell you more about that near the end of the talk. I have published uh, primary research funding uh, research findings um, in the area of team science. Most notably, my last publication came out last week, and I'm very excited. And in just a little bit, I'm going to engage in self, um, shameless self-promotion and send it around to the listserv. I just didn't have a chance to do that this morning, uh, but I will a little bit later on, so watch for that soon uh, with my really fantastic collaborator, Julie Thompson Klein. Uh, I've also developed and taught one of the very first ever team science courses. There's now an online version of that course. 
Um, and I chaired the Science of Teen Science Conference for its first three years and continue to be on the planning committee. I've been a paid team science consultant for a couple of dozen US universities and had the privilege of being involved in all three national team science panels within the US, the UK, and Canada. Uh, the last one's report should be out next month. All right, so um, let's start with some definitions so that we're all working on the same page. So let's talk about uh, team science. And one of the greatest things I think has ever been said about this is that society's problems do not fit neatly into our university's departmental grid. I also think that our university departmental grids don't actually align with one another. Um, and so there's opportunities for us to be thinking about the way we do science in our academic structures very differently than we do about individual investigator-driven research. So what am I talking about when I refer to team science? It actually has two components. Uh, the first is cross-disciplinary research, so working across disciplinary boundaries, and also the aspect of collaboration, which is human beings working together. And so you put those two things together, and that's what I'm referring to as team science. Now, it is possible to have disciplinary-based team science, um, but that's not nearly as difficult to engage in, and so that's actually not what I refer to. It's cross-disciplinary. So what do I mean by cross-disciplinary? Uh, well, the fact is that there are three different orientations for cross-disciplinary research, multi, inter, and transdisciplinary. And think of these things not uh, rather as fixed structures or fixed processes, but rather a spectrum of engagement across disciplinary boundaries. Uh, multidisciplinary starts at, at disciplines being pretty independent from one another, a little bit like the fruit basket you see on your right-hand side two different very distinct pieces of fruit that you can grab if you're hungry. Interdisciplinary research though is when there's more of a hybridization of ideas, sort of like the fruit salad that you see here in the middle of your slide. You can cut the fruit up together and uh, eat it all together and get a nice mixed fruit taste. And then there's transdisciplinary research or li I like to refer to as the fruit smoothie of research where you start to see reciprocity um, and the interdependence of, of different disciplines and in fact even emergence of new disciplines that comes up. Now, the problem with that, and that's based on the literature, all those definitions, is that the NIH and the NSF didn't bother to read the literature about cross-disciplinary research um, and went ahead and defined their own. And so this definition comes from the launch of the Roadmap for Biomedical Research. And what you'd see from this is that the NIH's definition of interdisciplinary research actually aligns better with the literature's definition of transdisciplinary research. Similarly, for the National Academies and the National Science Foundation that uses the National Academies uh, description. So um, here's my first practical piece of advice. Despite the fact that the literature has a, a great um, a set of references about these definitions and what's distinguished from what, um, because the NSF and the NIH use their own their definitions, in practice, when you're referring to cross-disciplinary research, and you're writing grants to any of the major federal funding agencies, I recommend that you just simply refer to it all as interdisciplinary research. You won't go wrong in that regard. The other component, um, along with cross-disciplinary research, is collaboration to team science. And what I'm showing you here is um, a set of different collaboration models all lined up with one another. Um, and what you see is that research, uh, despite when the model was first developed in the way that we think about collaboration, uh, research on collaboration showed that's always a process, um, and it mo always moves from an early stage of people not working together into later stages of working really closely together. And it kind of doesn't matter which stage of, uh, sorry, model of collaboration that you subscribe to, just know that it is like the spectrum of cross-disciplinary research, there is a spectrum of collaboration and the ability to go back and forth uh, between the different stages. So those are some of the, the basic terms that I'll be using. And as I said, others have slightly different terms that they may use, but this will at least have us all on the same page today. All right, so team science initiatives. These are large research, training, and translational programs. They're funded by universities and research institutions, federal agencies, and even sometimes foundations. Highly collaborative, interdisciplinary scientific approaches. Um, and in addition, they tend to extend across multiple dimensions of scope. And so you see here the graph on the right-hand side, we can have things on it. Uh, multiple levels on the geographical scale and an analytical scope and in terms of organizational scope as well, which means that team science initiatives are also quite complex. So what kind of science is facilitated by team science as opposed to, for example, individual investigator-driven research? 
So things like outcome-oriented um, investigations that are problem or product or project-oriented um, versus knowledge-producing science, when the research is urgent and complex, when there's sharing. Um, so we see this in, in multiple ways. There's a shared goal between investigators or shared um, uh, with different, from different disciplines or with different expertise, a shared approach through a common facility or instrumentation, and shared data sets. And I think we're gonna see more and more um, team science happening around shared data sets as we see an increase of data sharing. Uh, when federal funding agencies refer to intractable problems or grand challenges, they're generally talking about team science initiatives where successive efforts haven't been able to make progress and or the intellectual challenge has high payoff. Uh, importantly, what I want to say is that team science is complementary to and absolutely not mutually exclusive of individual investigator-driven research. Now, for this group, I wasn't worried about hiring a bodyguard to protect me virtually from you all, but I do have to say this, especially when I'm talking to researchers and some research leaders as well, and that's because um, people are very protective of their individual investigator-driven research in academia. I think you should continue to be. I'm not at all advocating for uh, the cessation of individual investigator-driven research. In fact, it's going to be and continue to be uh, knowledge, critical to knowledge-producing science. But the reason I emphasize team science uh, having come from industry myself, where I thought all science was done in teams, is that our academic structures are simply not set up to promote and enhance team science the way they are individual investigator-driven research. And so we have a dichotomy of the kind of research that's often done and recognized and rewarded, and new kinds of research and new processes and approaches that our academic structures don't support very well. All right, so um, that gets us then to the science of team science, or sites for short, and I like this quote too, team science is beholden to scholars of teamwork to aid in this area of practice. And in fact, the science of team science is a branch of knowledge that comes from the social sciences domain in team research. So why has sites uh, really grown very rapidly and we have a whole conference dedicated to it for almost a decade now? Um, science of team science is a relatively new interdiscipline, but a rapidly emerging field. It's concerned with understanding and managing the circumstances that both facilitate and hinder large-scale cross-disciplinary collaborative research. I think the field has grown in the last decade because there's a clear recognition uh, by society that science can help to answer some of the most pressing problems related to things like emerging diseases and energy. Um, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in the best way possible. Also in the last decade, we've seen issues related to cost effectiveness and accountability skyrocket as budgets have gotten uh, tightened. Oh, hey, can we just ask if you're not speaking, can you mute your phone? Then we won't hear your phone ringing in the background. Um, and, so, um, and so I think it's really great because this is an opportunity for, uh, to develop and to build from and leverage a strong evidence base as we move forward with team science initiatives. So there is some uniqueness of team science. We, we know this when we look at team research more broadly, that team science um, has some unique dimensions to it. So first, with regards to diversity, uh, that's actually quite diverse. We have teams that are homogeneous in nature to highly heterogeneous. Uh, in terms of integration, uh, we can have disciplinary, but what we mostly see is all the way to the level of transdisciplinary teams. There could be huge size differential in teams. Uh, from very small to mega-sized networks. Uh, generally speaking, you can have some teams that are co-located, but what we're seeing over time is that there's a global distribution of folks working together. Um, global alignment, sometimes there's good alignment, sometimes it's quite divergent. Um, boundaries tend actually not to be particularly stable for team science, but rather quite fluid. That is, most scientists, especially group leaders, are not participating in just one team. The way, for example, if you were on a sports team, if I was a member of the Chicago Cubs, I would be a member of only a single baseball team, which that would be so awesome because, of course, we won the World Series last year. But um, anyway, that's the side. I'm from Chicago. It's all exciting here again. Uh, so very, very fluid boundaries. We have early career people who come in and they go back off of teams. Um, and we do have a, a big range of low to high task interdependence on teams. And because of this kind of variation across team science, it's much more difficult an area to, to investigate. But we do, uh, we have been able to draw on the literature 
Uh, we know that there's an increased demand for team science initiatives in both academia and by external funding agencies. But as Amanda mentioned in her introduction, there are coordination costs to team science. And it means that that takes more time, at least proximally. What we see, and I'll show you some evidence of this from a really elegant study at the NIH, is that there's a distal payoff in terms of acceleration of research. So it's really imperative that we understand the most effective practices for productive cross-disciplinary collaboration and team science, and that we then use our understanding to train individuals and institutional leaders and funding agencies to employ the best practices. I consider all of us part of the institutional leadership, by the way. All right, so um, some team effectiveness findings from team research more broadly. Uh, we know that people part participating on teams provide multiple skills and skill sets, that teams have the ability to learn more and faster and can foster great creativity. That um, the learning faster and more and great creativity means that they have a tendency towards speed and innovation and the ability, therefore, to address complex problems, especially in challenging environments. And I like to think that our extramural funding um, environment right now is one of the most challenging we've ever encountered. All right, so what kind of science of team science evidence do we have to inform our practice? Well, um, and don't, okay, don't share this first piece with your first year graduate students. It's very unsettling for them. But it actually is increasingly difficult to make new scientific discoveries. Uh, and you need more people to find out more things. But we also know, um, and from the literature, that research is increasingly being done in teams for all fields, not just the sciences, but the humanities and the arts as well. And some things about teams and their outcomes is that they typically produce more highly cited research than do individuals. Teams that are more diverse are even more highly impactful. That's high citation is high impact research. Teams are more likely than solo authors to insert novel combinations of science into familiar knowledge domains. That's great because that gets us towards innovation. And papers of this type are twice as likely to be highly cited work, so highly impactful. More team science is being done interinstitutionally. So there was a time where we spent a lot of time just thinking about how to foster collaboration within our own institution. Uh, we need to be thinking about this interinstitutionally now. These distributed teams or virtual communities produce even higher impact work. And we know that if you take that uh, collaboration in teams internationally, this kind of international collaboration shows a further boost in citation impact. However, we also know from the literature that dispersed teams have a high rate of failure. So we know that when teams in, in research are successful, they succeed big, but when they fail, they're failing often. I like to look at that as a terrific opportunity for interventions. We also know from the literature that there's a likelihood for researchers to publish more papers earlier in their careers, albeit not necessarily first author papers, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we also have seen from the literature recently that women scientists who do not collaborate are less productive than men scientists. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, that is a topic, gender and team science is a topic for a whole other webinar, which I'm happy to give, but literally it's another 50-minute webinar that I do have all that information. Uh, we think about team science at multiple levels. Uh, so this is a commentary that I worked on with colleagues at the uh, first Science of Team Science conference, thinking about how we would go about, uh, about building out science of team science as a field. Uh, there's the individual level, so us as, as people, individuals. Uh, the meso level, that's how we interact with each other and as part of groups and the processes involved. And then there's the macro level. So that's the way teams interact with other teams, teams interact with their organizational structures, et cetera. So one of the other complicated themes, uh, uh, things around team science and studying it is that it has these multiple levels, which again is really quite different than um, a sports team, right? If I want to look at a team, I have only to look at the single team. Uh, there's also contextual factors that influence team science. Uh, there's the disciplinary. This is up in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, disciplinarity. Um, so having common languages between different disciplines can often uh, be quite challenging. Uh, there's interpersonal uh, aspects and factors that uh, influence things. So how we work with other people, dyadic relationships and such. Um, there's organizational. Uh, do we have strong organizational incentives to support collaborative teamwork? 
Um, this is the nature of the article that Julie and I just published, and I'm not, therefore I'm not talking about it today, but can talk about team science as it relates to recognition and reward. Uh, technology is a really important factor that influences team science. Um, I'm sure many of you have been in webinars where the screen refresh rate doesn't happen fast enough that you can actually uh, follow with the sound, which usually means that you stop looking at the screen. And that's not good if we're trying to build more um, uh, uh, trust between team members. There's societal and political factors. Um, um, so we're starting to see things like uh, policies around funding and less funding for large research initiatives, more funding for um, R01 uh, types of awards in the NIH, for example. Uh, the physical environment. So it turns out none of us like to have to get up and go walk somewhere to interact with somebody. Um, also, distraction-free work zones are, are really particularly problematic, um, but we have open labs and things like that. And then my favorite aspect and the one that I've uh, conducted research on is intraprofessional. And the intraprofessional is about how, uh, personal rather, is how you yourself are, are ready to collaborate. And if you will be at the Science of Team Science conference this year, you're going to get to hear from my colleague, um, Guy Lotreciano, who is talking about our collaboration readiness scale and tool that we're developing on this front right now. So on that intrapersonal uh, front, um, it's really about the motivations and deterrence. And this has gotten us to a program called Matrix, which, as I said, you'll hear more about at the conference if you're going to go. Um, but we aligned uh, motivations and deterrence for engaging in team science with some um, uh, frameworks from psychology and also did a, a search of the literature all the way back to the 1940s. What you see here in blue, uh, this is research um, uh, that we found that talked about why investigators want to participate in collaboration and that in the little yellow boxes is uh, why people want to avoid uh, team science. So we're looking at that and developing a collaboration readiness tool which we hope will be released in about six months time. Um, some really great and very elegant research that was done by the National Cancer Institute a few years back looked at this issue of team science versus individual science and uh, the outputs of that. And one of the ways that they measured the outputs or the outcome of this research is by looking at publications. And that matters a lot because publications are a, a critical currency for us in academic settings. And so what you see here is just a couple of figures out of this paper that they published in 2012. Uh, they looked at research centers, that's the teacher stands for uh, uh, Tobacco Translational Use Research Centers, and then um, R01 or Individual Investigator Grants. Um, without going into detail, they needed two controls um, of individual grants for the research centers, and that's what the red and the green lines represent. Don't worry about why they needed them. They needed them, they did a good job, and they're both shown here. Um, and the first graph, what they're showing is they looked at the annual publication output of either the big research center teams or the individual R01 funded investigator grants. And what you do see is that it's clear the red and green lines uh, representing the individual research grants is that research publications are happening um, much sooner after the onset of the award date. Uh, however, at just about four and a quarter years, what we start to see um, is that the rate of uh, research output so the teams has caught up because there'd been an acceleration starting at around uh, year three. And then we see that the output and the acceleration continue of the research. When they looked at cumulative publications, that is over time, um, the, the same thing. So we see that the centers lag in the number of publications, right, about four years. Um, and then all of a sudden, at about four and a half, we start to see an acceleration of research and it continues to go on. So even if we look at cumulative uh, factors, we see this acceleration. It was also in this study is where they looked at the number of papers and the nature of the investigators on the, the blue papers, that is from the research centers. And this is where they identified that earlier career researchers were publishing earlier in their careers. And that's really important from a uh, perspective of promotion and tenure. For example, having more publications in your portfolio earlier on, that's critically important for promotion and tenure in academia. All right, what I'm gonna do now is switch a, a little bit because you guys are um, really the, the applications, right? Your focus is on the praxis of team science, although maybe some of you are also researchers engaged, engaged in science of team science, but you're really looking for the practical ways to engage and coach your researchers. So let's talk now about some of the tools that you can use 
Uh, this is about half of them that I have available, and I'm always happy to talk about some of the others in another webinar um, later on this year. So um, this is really about the practical side, but it's really also from an evidence base, and from my perspective, that's critically important. Um, and the reason I say that is good intentions are fantastic, but after all, we are scientists and engineers, and we should be drawing upon the evidence base and the social sciences to help guide us, because after all, team science is a sociological activity. All right, so let's first focus on leadership in team science. I think that's um, an area that will resonate with many of you. And uh, here, talking about a quote that really, the leaders have the opportunity to really drive uh, team science and the integration um, across disciplinary and boundaries in a team. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities that require multiple leaders, and you're probably working with those in, in your role. In fact, multiple leaders are wonderfully uh, valuable for larger, more dispersed teams with multiple sites, because you have somebody at each of the sites, each of the institutions. It helps to ensure that separate units build buy-in and commitment to the overarching team goal or goals. Uh, however, having multiple leaders means that you must design effective coordination and information exchange. Um, it's really essential. And um, it, it, these are also really important when you're increasing sustainability of collaborations than when research results have to be disseminated to community partners. All right, so keeping that in mind, though, with having multiple leaders, one of the downfalls for us in science is that we make this terrible mistake. Um, if you haven't already seen this movie, Moneyball, I highly recommend it. Yes, it's about baseball, um, but not really. What it is, is, is um, it's all about science, to be told, uh, truth be told. So it, it, it's really the analogy for the way we engage in science, uh, Moneyball, and it's like 90 minutes of Brad Pitt, and you know that makes for a good movie in my mind any time of day. Uh, but in here, they examine team composition. And, uh, and the conclusion from the movie, don't worry, I won't spoil anything, it's still awesome to watch, is that a team of experts does not necessarily make for the best expert team. But actually in science, our MO is to pull together a team of experts, pick the most highly qualified senior, most leaders in particular areas and bring them together. The problem with that is it looks a lot like too many chefs in the kitchen. So one of the things that was really uh, prominent in the uh, team literature is around um, uh, teams and how expertise and coaching go hand in hand. And I think this is really valuable guidance for everybody uh, who's part of Interreach. It turns out that if you take a group of experts and, and you give them a task, so we're talking about task-oriented teams, which scientific teams are, um, if, you, if you take a group of experts and you ask them to engage in the, in the uh, task, but you actually just leave them together. Too many chefs in the kitchen, and there's nobody to help manage that. You actually get really poor performance. That's the lower right-hand corner. Uh, if you in introduce um, a coach, that's great. They can actually improve their performance on the task that you've asked. If you have, um, uh, whoops, sorry about that. If you have, uh, oh, I'm sorry. If you have lots of experts and no coaching, though, they do a terrible job. An absolutely terrible job at the, at the task that's been assigned to them. Um, but if you give them a coach, then you can get the very best performance out of a high expertise team. But you have to have somebody that's going to help them with all of that. And it's the significantly impaired performance that worries me. Because it's not just they don't do their best. It's that they perform worse than all other combinations. And that's usually how we organize our teams and leadership in academia. It's really critical, therefore, that we have the right mix of expertise as well as team players, and that some sort of intervention or coaching is going to help us use the collective expertise really well. So I like to think of interreach professionals as the coach of the uh, 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team in the U.S. Now, um, they did happen to win the gold medal that year, uh, but more importantly, they beat the crap out of the USSR. And what's exciting about this is that none of the team members were necessarily recruited because they were the very best in the positions in which they played. Rather, what they did was bring these guys together and have them train as a team for a significant amount of time leading up to the Olympics, more so than had ever been done before. Further, the coach that they brought in had at one time also been on an Olympic ice hockey team. 
However, he never played a single game in the uh, U.S. Or, sorry, in the Olympics. He was actually cut from the team right before. So they brought in a leader who hadn't even himself had the experience of playing in the Olympics, but brought him on to be the leader to help them use that collective expertise well, and it worked. All right, so um, that's some of the ways that you can think about your role then in interreach and being that intervention and that coach for the teams that you're working in. I also want you to think about how you're putting teams together. Um, and what we're really looking for if we're doing induced team science is, is promoting innovation and impact of the teams. I mentioned before that some of the highest impact science is grounded in conventional combinations of prior work and combine that with novel combinations. Papers that report on this kind of research are twice as likely to be highly cited works, and teams are almost 40% more likely than solo authors to insert the novel combinations into familiar knowledge domains. Teams are just better at doing this because they have a collective set of skills, and this gets us more innovation and impact. So thinking about how we develop our teams and pull people together is really important. Moreover, the literature has told us that a higher fraction of incumbents, people who are already familiar with the research project or and or the disciplines involved, versus newcomers, that is people who haven't previously been part of the team, is better. So a higher fraction of incumbents versus newcomers is better because they contribute expertise and know-how to the team. But it turns out only up to a point. After a certain point, they start to lose their value, these incumbents. And what this research further went on to show is that more diversity in teams is better. And those that are less diverse typically have lower levels of performance. They also said don't repeat collaborations with the same team members over and over and over again, especially if you're lacking diversity. And this is the, but only up to a point. What starts to happen is new ideas aren't going in and that old group, the one that's really been working together a lot, starts to look like just an individual investigator. Also, this research demonstrated the teams that are formed by individuals with large but disparate sets of collaborators themselves are more likely to be able to draw from a more diverse reservoir of knowledge, and they perform better. So it's not just the individuals and how disparate they are from one another on the team, but it's their disparate set of collaborators or their network that matters a lot. So I like to think that we should all be paying attention to our networks. Now, quite unfortunately, this visualization I'm showing you from LinkedIn, used to be called LinkedIn Maps, doesn't exist anymore. And, and August uh, 28th, 2014 was the last day you could get this visualization, but it was great. And even without the visualization, it's an opportunity for you to think about how you're connected and how the researchers that you're bringing together to work on teams are connected in their networks. Um, I'm particularly fond of this visualization because it puts me in the center of my own universe. That's fantastic. I'm like the sun in my own universe. Uh, but what you can see here is that the, the biggest purple uh, reddish group on the left hand side, those are my Northwestern University colleagues. They're there for 15 years. You meet lots of people. Uh, the blue group in the upper left hand corner are former students of mine. Um, the economic development industry engagement people are kind of uh, spread all throughout there. Um, interestingly, um, the orange people are my research development and probably interreach colleagues now too. The, the green uh, group, which is further apart, all the way on the right-hand side, those are all my Elsevier colleagues. And I did joke once with my boss that, you know, thank goodness they hired me because I, I connect Elsevier to the world of research. And um, actually, I got a really nice praise back <laughs> and that they were grateful that I'd come and joined Elsevier. Um, the group that's down at the bottom, that's my... Um, the, the bright orange down at the bottom, that's my nonprofit group. And so um, it's not surprising at all that that part of my network would be more disconnected from the rest of my network. So it just gives you an idea. So if you want to think about your own LinkedIn network or ask the colleagues you're working about about the nature of their collaborators and with whom they engage, is it just one color that they might imagine um, and visualize for their networks? Or are there multiple different colors and groups of people with whom they interact? Of some other research that we can draw on, I think that is really useful for inner reach professionals, is that we can learn from some research done at Harvard um, related to teaming, which is about flexible teamwork. And I think this works great, especially in, in our um, uh, boundaries that are, are constantly fluid, uh, because a characteristic of a flexible teamwork is that it's complex and uncertain situations, full of unexpected events. God, that's science all the way. 
no two projects look alike and people have to get up to speed quickly on new topics. Um, and so those definitely are some challenges, the characteristics of the way we engage in, in scientific teamwork. Uh, but there's some advantages. Um, individuals acquire knowledge, skills, and networks that they might not otherwise have uh, access to. You can respond very quickly to new challenges in this kind of uh, structure, be nimble and innovative, and ability to solve cross-disciplinary challenges. So knowing that, then there's some teaming activities that leaders can engage in. And this can be in a reach professionals, it can be the senior PIs that you're working with, it can be other leaders as well. Um, importantly, uh, focus on project management, thinking about scoping out the project and articulating it to the team. Thinking specifically about how the team is gonna be structured and who's gonna be responsible for which tasks. There's teaming behaviors and encouraging those, allowing for and providing the opportunity for people to speak up, to experiment within the team and even fail. Uh, to reflect, not just reflect on the kind of science or research that you're engaged in, but how it is about working with one another, which involves listening intently and integrating ideas that are put forward. Um, from a team leadership perspective, it's really emphasizing the purpose of the team um, and building in psychological safety for team members, which includes helping them identify what are their purposes and how that aligns to what the team's doing. This again matters in our academic structures because we spend so much of our time focused on individual accomplishment in terms of recognition and reward that it can be often difficult to also align that with team goals. And again, just being able to embrace failure and managing conflict, not trying to eliminate it, that would be pretty impossible, but managing the conflict so that it is productive and focused on the research, not on uh, people and personalities. All right, let's switch a little where we've been talking about leadership and drawing on the evidence from the literature about how we can engage in strong leadership activities to promote team science. The next thing that I want to focus on is communication and team science. And one of my very favorite quotes ever, communication is elevated to the essence of collaboration. All right, so what do we know um, in terms of communication as it leads to trust which is really one of the, the core issues uh, related to success in team science. We know that different structures at multiple levels from societal down to individual can enhance and or undermine trust and research integrity within team science. Uh, in science um, uh, collaboration, misunderstandings, disagreement, and conflict happen quite often. I guess the good news is we tend not to have a groupthink problem. So the joke goes, have three scientists in the room have five opinions. So we don't have a group thing problem, more or less. Uh, we do tend, though, to have a problem in not recognizing others' expertise. And this is especially so outside of our own discipline, outside of our own sector. We have different assumptions that we make about the paradigms of the science in which we're working in. Uh, this is especially notable a bit between quantitative and qualitative sciences, for example. There are cultural differences, and I'm not talking about ethnic, racial, um, and uh, national differences, but cultural differences within our discipline, in addition to all of those other kinds of cultural differences. Um, as scientists and engineers, we tend to lack um, a great knowledge of process skills. It's not like we ever took classes on how to lead effective meetings, for example. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this already, but the institutions that were in our academic structures don't necessarily provide incentives for working in teams and, and engaging in collaboration, but rather for our individual efforts. All of these things then have the ability to lead to mistrust. And so we have to focus on issues of communication that promote trust, both when building teams and when participating in the research team. So it is so, um, and the literature tells us that face-to-face -face interaction in the team is truly essential for developing the strongest levels of trust. Um, and high-tech communication, such as email and video conferencing, tends to strip away personal interaction that's needed and has become very essential for building trust. In fact, there was some other research that said you could meet um, over a period of years uh, uh, in a distributed technology, and you wouldn't build up as much trust as you could in a single in-person meeting. So teams have to get together initially to build trust, but then also periodically to recharge that trust. And because this kind of thing is important as you're thinking about building your grant proposal budget, I provide here on the bottom the uh, a reference that you can use. So when you're building in your budget costs, you can provide that in your budget justification. 
Uh, there's some other things about us working together and communicating who's going to do what um, and managing conflict. One of my very favorite uh, research resources for team science is this guide called Collaboration in Team Science, developed in the Office of the Ombudsman um, at the NIH. And despite the fact that it was developed at the NIH, it absolutely has applicability to every aspect of research, every discipline of research, every knowledge domain, not only limited to biomedical. And in this partner agreement, it's an opportunity to engage in constructive communication with regards to the research project, to talk about and agree on overall goals and vision, to have an understanding of who is going to do what on the team, about sharing um, and storing reagents and data, issues related to authorship and credit, because those matter in academic structures especially. Contingencies in communicating and managing conflict of interest, those last two collectively about managing conflict overall. This is free, and I strongly recommend if you haven't already downloaded and take a look at it, you should get yourself a copy of this, and you should use it and share it with all of the researchers with whom you're working. Another resource for communication is something called the Toolbox Project, and um, they're actually going to have a great session at the upcoming Science of Teen Science Conference. There are also uh, consultants who you can bring onto campus. There's also the possibility of being, um, uh, being trained to be a uh, toolbox project um, uh, uh, facilitator. So what's really neat about this is it was originally developed by a group of philosophers um, who had NSF funding. And they built this for researchers um, in the STEM disciplines to start with. But it's really about a self-awareness, um, so those intrapersonal aspects of collaboration, and then sharing those and understanding about others' motivations and understanding of science as well. Um, so the way the Toolbox Project works is that there's a, a questionnaire that all members of the team fill out on their own independently, and then come together to talk about the answers that they've put in. Importantly, there are no right or wrong answers. It's really about each person's individual perspective, and that matters a lot. So from the toolbox questionnaire, here's just an example of motivation, for example, and that's the philosophical domain. Um, and we're understanding here about the understanding of, of science and, and the meaning of science. And the core question uh, evolves around the principal value of research, whether it stems from its applicability for solving problems or its potential for making basic discoveries. And then you see these five related questions, which if I was to answer, uh, number one, it would be applied research is more important to me than basic research. I would circle number five that I agree. I would probably bold it, highlight it, and put lots of little asterisks around it because that's how I feel about science, and that's what drives me, what motivates me to engage. Now, that's interesting, and that's fine. Again, there's nothing wrong or right. But now let's say that I'm working with somebody like a theoretical physicist who is likely actually to, to do one, disagree. Now, it's not a problem that we have very divergent perspectives on, on what motivates us. But it is important that we recognize the differences in our motivations and how that's going to impact how we engage with each other and other members of the team. Now, I will tell you, I've been trained to be a facilitator for this. It doesn't work at all when people aren't honest, when they answer the way they think others want them to answer. So as long as you really strongly encourage that people answer as honestly as possible, it's actually very, very effective in terms of discussion. There's another tool, it's an online diagnostic tool for geographically or distributed teams called the Collaboration Success Wizard. It was built by the University of California, Irvine. Um, and this survey helps to propose factors that strengthen and weaken the collaboration. And it focuses on socio-technical factors. So um, both the social and the way we have interpersonal skills, but also on the technological factors that engage in a team. So, for example, we recently had a conversation here within the InterReach community um, as to which online platforms we might want to use to help facilitate collaboration amongst ourselves. And it was deemed pretty early on that actually we don't have the wherewithal and the capacity to use these right now. And so we're not going to. Um, instead, have a basic website, uh, the webinar series, and the listserv, and that that's the extent of how this group wanted to collaborate for now. That's really important because otherwise, had we taken a lot of time to work on implementing these other platforms, only to have people not use them would actually probably drawn away from and detracted from the kind of collaboration we're looking to build in this new community. What I really like about this is that you can engage everybody on the team to participate in this. 
you get um, a real set of outcomes and an analysis of everybody. And you can use this kind of information um, and, and in grant proposals such as major research centers, you can talk about the preliminary evidence that you've collected around your teams on what their strengths are and areas that you know you need to enhance or improve upon, and especially whether or not you want to use any of the budget to be able to assist with that. So really great. I think the only downside of this tool is that it takes about 25, 30 minutes from start to finish, and I do find a lot of investigators are put off by having to spend that much time in the tool. Uh, in the end, I want to just tell you, uh, I like this one, this quote too, collaboration is a journey, not a destination. So it's something that we're likely to be engaged in over and over again, that researchers won't just start it, but that it'll be something that they're engaged in over the long haul. So I want to leave you with some additional tools then. Um, the first, and I just wrote about this last week to the listserv, is the Science of Team Science group on Mendeley. Um, and you can join that group. Um, it's a public group, and so last week I sent the URL that if you just click on it, you can join the group. Alternatively, if you want me to send you a personal invitation so that when you get a link, you'll get right to it, just shoot me a quick note, and I'll be happy to, to uh, send you an invitation to join the group. And uh, what's really great about that is that there's already almost three dozen um, different uh, subfolders with about half of the 2,000 articles um, curated into those three dozen folders already. And so you can see it's on lots of different topics like credit and promotion and tenure. Uh, there's a must read. So if you scroll about halfway down, there's a must read folder. It has, I think, 11 references. It's a great way for somebody new to team science to start going in this as well. It's a community resource. When I started, it had 32 references that I had identified. Um, and over the last seven years, it's grown to this 2000 plus in large part because other people are adding to it as well and because I'm curating it. There's the Science of Team Science listserv, and like this interreach listserv is not very busy, but it's highly collegial and very, very informative. So I recommend that if team science is something you want to become more engaged in, um, or if you already are and not already on this listserv, that you subscribe to this listserv as well. There is, as I've already mentioned, the upcoming Science of Team Science conference for this year. It's going to be in Clearwater Beach, Florida, and registration is still open. Um, so you have time to register, and um, I hope to see many, many of you um, in Florida in just a couple of weeks. There's also a great resource that was built by the National Cancer Institute, but again, not limited only to biomedical or even only cancer research, but for researchers much more broadly. Um, and it's a great online uh, repository of information and experts that you can access as well. There's also a couple of reports that have come out. I mentioned at the very beginning um, some of the national team science initiatives. The first was by the National Academies in the US, and their report, Enhancing the Effectiveness of Team Science, um, was published. And this report is available for free downloading as a PDF, or you can order yourself a copy of the book. It is a small fee. I think it's under 50 bucks. Uh, in the UK, the Academy of Medical Sciences wrote a report specifically on improving recognition and team science contributions. Now, the title of the report says, In Biomedical Research Careers, but I promise you, it's, it has grand applicability across all knowledge domains and not just the biomedical research um, space. And there, they focus mostly on recognition of team science and contributions. The upcoming Canadian report is going to have an even stronger, further emphasis on recognition and contributions focused mostly in the promotion and tenure domain. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to tell you about some of the work that I do here at Elsevier. And it's about developing um, analytics and uh, tools that help to foster collaboration. And actually, you can download our brochure that talks about all of the resources that we have for facilitating collaboration and the kinds of things that I provide input on and work on and use that evidence base that I've been talking about for this webinar to um, uh, inform the kinds of things that we're doing at Elsevier. Um, and mostly it has to do with our Elsevier Research Intelligence Portfolio um, and uses a number of different components of that to identify current um, and discover potential collaborators, to have data-driven analysis of collaborative behavior and the impact of that kind of research, and to facilitate more powerful collaborations through our tools. So we have a series of them, Mendeley, as I've already talked about, which has um, the large science of team science um, group in it, but also lots of ways for people to work together in small public and private groups. We have a tool called SciVal that um, uh, uh, provides an assessment of performance 
of research partnerships on a global scale and at an institutional scale. Also importantly, looks across sectors. So opportunities to understand collaboration as it exists, for instance, between academic and industry partners, and thinking about where there are great opportunities to build on the potential for those. We have a, a, a tool called PURE, which is a research networking system that helps institutions develop expertise profiles of faculty at their institutions and then look at the connectedness of their faculty intra-institutionally as well as inter-institutionally. And you're seeing some of the visualizations of those networks and collaborations here. Uh, we also have a, a custom group that does analytical services to understand um, institutional research performance through collaboration. And we combine our own data with um, external data, uh, such as NIH and NSF funding, and also with institutions' own data. And so I will end there with my formal part of the webinar and the presentation to all of you. And then we'll leave the rest of the time for me to answer any questions that you might have and also to just engage in, in a, a dialogue and more discussion around team science and, and great information sharing amongst all of that, all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. That was a very um, informative and comprehensive overview of the resources that are available to folks like us who are trying to make this, this new model for collaboration something that's more readily accepted and easily implementable, if that's the right word. Um, so I, let's open up the floor to anyone who has a comment or a, a question for Holly. I have a question, Holly. This is Matt. Yeah, hey, Matt. Hi. Uh, for the the collaboration success wizard, is there a, is there a cost for that? No, it's free. Okay. Yeah, so what I should tell you, except for the Elsevier offerings, <laughs> although half of them are free as well, um, everything that I shared with you are all free. I guess that that is an important uh, thing I should have said. Yes, yeah, free because I'm, you know, I'm all about free, and um, that's, that's easiest for all of us. So yeah, okay. the only things that have a cost are some of the commercial offerings that also do, but not even all of them. The Mendeley is free. It, it's a tool that comes from the portfolio of research intelligence solutions, but it's entirely free for researchers. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Holly, I'll ask a question. This is Amanda McMillan. Yeah. Um, you, uh, these are evidence-based tools that that you and resources that you've you've gone over, and I'm 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 curious about the evidence base itself. Uh, here at Duke, we just put in um, our re competitive renewal application for our CTSA grant, yeah. and we were doing some creative thinking about team science and and what we could add to that conversation. And something that we arrived at was the possibility of sort of designing. Um, research studies around what makes a team function at the highest possible level. Um, and so I'm wondering if what you might consider some of the maybe persistent gaps in our evidence base for team science, what makes it high? Yeah, impact. so I think to your, to your very point is about these issues of evaluating the teams and having tools. So actually, um, through the CTFA consortium, there is a subgroup of the collaboration, not working group, yeah, it's collaboration working group, right, that's the right name for it, and mm -hmm. I've been actually part of that, and we're, uh, they just presented sort of the findings of a literature review. Uh, my problem with that is that they try, they, they look too narrowly, instead of drawing on the broader team research literature, they only look that which is already in the biomedical sciences domain. And then uh -huh. found that there wasn't there wasn't already a tool that you could use to evaluate. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. Um, that is a shortcoming. That's why we draw on the literature more broadly. So I think that evaluating teams is going to be a very important one, and that comes in at multiple levels. So are you evaluating the performance and the outcome? So such as uh, research articles and their output. In which case, actually, there's great evidence that says I showed it, you know, here today that that demonstrates that teams are more effective, more effective than that. Uh -huh. If what you're looking at, um, there's also some really great work that was done with translational research teams um, uh, by people like Bill Trosham and Dan Stokels and Kara Hall, and there's some great articles that you can draw on from there. 
But I think one of the biggest things is that it's the evaluation of biomedical research teams that we haven't done as much research on. So we could draw from the literature and start to develop models, but then they do have to be tested. And it's actually one of my uh, objections to the way that NCATS has gone about team science. They're acting as if they created their own problem, right? Like right. team science was just something that NCATS came up with or the CTSAs, <laughs> and that's so not right. Now, right. that said, team science has become a critically important component that's now part of the RFAs. That's very, those first three RFAs had, did not have the words team science in it at all. And um, for a long time then at Northwestern, when we started our team science unit, it was a huge distinguishing feature for us, but one also that I was delighted to see that we helped roll out across the entire um, hub consortium. But I think that it's the evaluation. So we have to look at is drawing on the broader literature of team research, how do we then evaluate translational teams? And what are the things that you're most interested? Is it the outcome? Do you also want to know about the process? So identifying right. which facets of evaluation you want to engage in is also going to be important. But before you promote, you talk about something, there is this group on collaboration evaluation already happening. There's also a collaboration work group. So wow. whatever you put forward, I would just make sure that it's aligned with the NCATS, the consortium, CTSA yeah, consortium level activities. That makes sense. Yeah, it's interesting because um, when we were looking for intellectual input for our team science core, we looked to our business school, um, and there is a team science expert there, and that person sort of informed some of the, the thought process there. I mean, it's, I, I think, too, I, I feel like a, a, the evidence base is very driven towards these outcome metrics, right? So the, the productivity, the, the output. There's a lot like about that. process, though. There's a lot that you can find in the literature about process. And uh -huh. how uh, about process and diversity, actually, about pro um, productivity because of diversity, productivity okay. because of process. There's a uh -huh. lot in the literature about that as well. Okay, excellent. And are there any sort of uh, novel metrics that we might consider for, I guess, process um, evaluation in terms beyond productivity? I, I just, that's sort of, I'm, that's a rhetor not a rhetorical question, but I'm not, I don't know that there's an answer, but <laughs> I wonder what those might yeah, be. Yeah, so it has to, it's going to depend on what the nature of the research is, you know, so are you mm -hmm. looking to measure outcomes as it relates to, you know, being able to translate all the way to policy? You know, mm -hmm. what are the outcomes along the T0 through T4 spectrum that you're thinking are most important? And that really matters, too, because mm -hmm. depending on the kind of translational teams, it, you know, are they teams that are focused mostly on T0 and T1 research? Well, then the outcomes that you care about are really quite different than teams that are focused on T3 or T4 research. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a good point. And for folks, those of you who are not involved in, in new CATS, CTSAs, and translational research, uh, the translational research has a spectrum from T0 to T4. T0 is um, underlying fundamental basic science discoveries. T4 is um, uh, research into clinic practice and policy. I do, though, hang on, I'm going to show you this. Oops. That's all about gender. What I want to show you, hang on, I'll just share my screen again. Can you see my screen again? Yep. Okay, so in the Mendeley group, Right, I'm looking at the desktop version. You can look on it in line too. But here, the sciences team science group. I actually, oh, don't want to move that. Um, I actually have an entire folder of translational research and CTSAs, and in there, about 200 documents specifically around team science as it relates to translational research and CTSAs. So wow. there's lots of good stuff. In there. <laughs> yeah, lots of good stuff in there. And then, um, let me see if it was the, here, and then the group that was the group I was been part of, CTSA for developing measures for assessing and improving collaborations. This is all the literature that we came up just for that study. So there's a hundred different documents in there. So those are, those are two really great groups of literature that you might want to pull from, because that was the CTSA project specifically on assessment. Although I, it was a lackluster outcome of that group, to be honest with you. It was um, it was very academic exercise rather than focusing on practical opportunities. They they decided to 
leave out important research that wasn't biomedical in other domains of team research. Anyway, I'm, I'm not happy about it. I don't think they really gained anything. We worked on it for like a year. Um, and we're still arguing over like where we should publish an article. And I haven't even seen a draft of the article yet. But on that, and then the translational research and CTSAs. Lots of stuff that's been done. And you can even search. So, yeah, so even if I just looked at the stuff that's on evaluation in, in this, um, oops. Then I would see, you know, so it's um, about half of the literature that's in there is about research. Um, so, Holly, I'm sorry, where is this? Um, this is the Mendeley group. In the Mendeley group, okay, great. In the Mendeley group, in the science of team science. So, it's Mendeley, I just happen to be looking at the desktop. It's in the uh -huh. science of team science library or group. And okay. then you'll see that there's two subfolders one that starts CTSA and one that's translational. Perfect. Amanda, are you already part of the group or not yet? I am not the designated member of the group. I'm not entirely sure who is, but I'll look into it and then pass this along. No, you can be. So individuals are. So I'll send you an invitation okay. right after. So you can oh, join. great. Yeah, that'd be perfect. That yeah, but for great. translational research, I specifically have two major groups of literature that I've been putting together. Great. That's fantastic. So lots of stuff. I mean, what would be awesome, I just don't have the wherewithal right now, it would be really great if somebody was willing to do sort of um, um, uh, an annotated bibliography of these. It'll probably amount to 250 different references total. Um, it would be great if somebody was going to be willing to do an annotated bibliography of how this research relates to translational um, science and CTSAs in particular, but um, yeah, the NIH would have to sort of commission that and get somebody to do it, but it would be really awesome if they did. But um, for the most part um, of the report on field visits, we try to have the PDFs, although I'll try to find out if I can get a URL for that, but lots of them, then there's the PDF and our URLs available for the literature, like here, so it should be pretty easy to get to these articles. That is great, thank you so much.